Hello, George Romanich here. In today's video, we are going to talk about various ways of quantifying the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. As you see here in my previous video, I talked about the importance of water vapor and water in general in our atmosphere. And we talked about phase changes, how certain phase changes take energy from the system. Another phase changes of water release energy to the system. That's all discussed in the previous video. Now, water enters the atmosphere as water vapor. And then all kinds of phase changes happen. Because these phase changes release or take energy, it is very important to know how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Because that's what that that's what fuels weather. That's one of the most important properties of our atmosphere in terms of weather and particularly weather changes. So let us now discuss what are these variables or various ways that we can express the amount of water vapor in our atmosphere. To do that, I want to be a little bit technical and I will start from Dalton's law of partial pressures. I have an entire video on Dalton's law of partial pressures if you need to refresh your memory. But basically, that uh, law says that total pressure, so total pressure in a gas, in a mixture of gases, is equal pressure exerted by gas 1 plus pressure exerted by gas number two in that mixture plus as many gases as we have in the mixture plus pressure exerted by gas number n. Because atmosphere is mixture of gases, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little bit less than 1% argon, there is water vapor as well, we can apply this law to atmosphere and say that total pressure is pressure by gas 1, and that would be nitrogen, plus pressure by gas 2, and that would be oxygen, O2, plus pressure of argon, and so on. So plus three dots. And then we will separate pressure exerted by water vapor, H2O. But as we discussed in some of my previous videos, in atmospheric sciences, we do not write pressure of water vapor in this way. We, because water vapor is so important, we have a special symbol for it. And that symbol is small e. Because these gases cannot condense or uh, change phases in the atmosphere, we lump all them together and we call that pressure of dry air. So we would say that total pressure exerted by a parcel of air is pressure exerted by dry air, and that's nitrogen, oxygen, argon, krypton, CO2, CO, and so on, plus pressure exerted by water vapor. And uh, this is really a very important result because in the context of today's video, it already gives us one way of quantifying the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, and that's through this variable over here, and that's partial pressure exerted by water vapor. So, if I take this volume of air over here, there is pressure exerted by that air, that pressure is pressure of dry air plus pressure exerted by water vapor. So, in absolute terms, what would be this pressure, E? Well, this pressure is rarely, if ever, more than 4% of the total pressure exerted by air. So, you know that standard pressure is around 1000 millibars, which is 1000 hectopascals. Officially, mean sea level pressure is 1,013.25 millibars, but let's say 1,000. So, 4%, that means that E 
is generally smaller than 40 millibars. Okay? So, right now you are watching this video, thank you very much for that, but as you are watching this video, water vapor is, is exerting pressure on your body that is probably below 40 millibars. If it is above that, then that's very special circumstance. So, this is one way of quantifying amount of water vapor in our atmosphere, and that's a very common way of, you, of uh, doing this job in atmospheric sciences. But of course, there are other ways as well. Another way that is also very, very useful is known as mixing ratio. What is mixing ratio? Well, it is defined, we often use small r, it is defined as mass of water vapor divided by mass of dry air. Because similar to this equation, we can say that total mass of air, which we, which we denote with m, is mass of dry air, and that would be nitrogen, oxygen, and so on, plus mass of water vapor in that parcel of air. And consequently, mixing ratio is defined as the ratio of the mass of water vapor to the mass of dry air. This is very useful quantity because it stays conserved even if we change volume of the parcel of air that we are investigating. This quantity also gives us the relative percentage, so to speak, of mixing of water vapor with other gases in a parcel of air. That's why it's called mixing ratio. There is another quantity similar to mixing ratio that is also often used, and that is called specific humidity. Specific humidity, often denoted with little q, is equal also mass of water vapor, but we do not divide by the mass of dry air, but we rather divide by the total mass of air. Because dry air is most of the air, these quantities are very similar, difference is usually below 1% or so. So, that's another way of quantifying. Actually, these two are so similar that I know that some people that should know the difference mix them up. Sometimes they call mixing ratio this quantity, but this is not mixing ratio, this is specific humidity. But that's because they are so similar. If you use them interchangeably, you don't make that big of a mistake in most cases, not always though. Sometimes you can mess it up. And then there is last quantity uh, I would like to introduce here, but this one is least used and you will see why. This quantity is called uh, absolute humidity. And absolute humidity is denoted with little a and it again Represents, of, represents mass of water vapor, but we are not now dividing by masses, we are dividing by the volume of the air from which we took this mass of water vapor. Okay, let's talk about benefits of this uh, quantity. Well, benefit of this quantity is, if you look at it, it represents actually density of water vapor in air because it's mass over volume, but just mass of water vapor. So, if we, if we know A, namely absolute humidity, we can talk about density of water vapor. That's very good. But there is something that is not very good, and that's that the quantity depends on volume. So, if we change volume of air, despite the fact that MV did not change, absolute humidity will change, and that's not good. I have many videos on how pressure changes 
with height, with the altitude. And we know that pressure decreases exponentially with the height. And that means if I take this parcel of air, this one, and I start lifting it, that parcel of air expands. Volume increases because pressure decreases. Well, volume increases means that even if the amount of water vapor stay the same in the parcel of air, this quantity will decrease with height. So it's not good in atmospheric sciences and we rarely use it. So the question is, why would we use it ever? Well, we use it and it's quite good if you have measurements, for example, in indoor environments where you know that pressure is not changing that much, volume of air that you imagine stays pretty much the same size, so you can use this. But when you look at the atmosphere as a large, as a very large big real estate, which it is, then this quantity is not the best option. To finish this video, just so you have some ideas in your head, uh, what are the typical values of these quantities, let us make maybe this simple table. If I have here mass of air, and let me say it is one kilogram for convenience. If I have volume of one cubic meter, and let us say that in this one kilogram of air and, and one cubic meter of air, mass of water vapor is one gram. Okay, that is 0 0.001 kilogram if you want. But we often mass of water vapor express in grams because it's very little amount, so gram is more convenient. Now, from here we can start calculating these various quantities. For example, we can calculate Q, specific humidity. Specific humidity, you will remember, is MV divided by M, so that would be one gram per kilogram. Consequently, you can also see, let me emphasize this, for example, Q, that is MV over M, in principle is non-dimensional because I am dividing two masses, but we like to express it as grams of water vapor per kilogram of moist air. Similarly, mixing ratio, that was mass of water vapor divided by the mass of dry air, is also non-dimensional quantity, but once again, we like to express, express it as grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air. Now, for example, if we want to calculate this R, then we need mass of dry air. But we can express mass of dry air knowing mass of moist air and mass of water vapor. So we will know that mass of water vapor would be 1 kilogram minus 1 gram. That should be 0 0.0001. Kilograms. That should be mass, uh, sorry, mass of dry air. Uh, I just uh, messed up subscript. Mass of dry air should be 0 0.999 kilograms, which consequently means that mixing ratio becomes MV divided by MD. So MV, MV divided by MD, that is one gram divided by 0 0.999, well, 1 divided by 0 0.999 should be 1.001 gram per kilogram. So now, if you compare this quantity with my Q, you will see that they are very, very similar. If you look Closely, you will see the difference is just 0.1%. So very similar quantities. And lastly, if I can squeeze in here. Uh, sorry, that's my cat playing around. If I squeeze here uh, 
specific, sorry, absolute humidity for your refreshment, absolute humidity is mass of water vapor divided by volume of air. So that would be one gram divided by one cubic meter. That would be, well, one gram per cubic meter. But now, just so you see how this absolute humidity is not the best option, let's keep everything the same, but I increase volume to two cubic meters. Now volume is two cubic meters, this stays the same. Now look at this, this will stay the same. This will stay the same. This will stay the same. But absolute humidity will change because now I need to divide 1 divided by 2. So I will halve this value, namely 0 0.5 grams per cubic meter. And uh, of course, that's not very desirable property of this uh, variable. I'm pretty sure that now it's the end of this video and many of you are asking yourselves, but how about in famous relative humidity? That's what weathermen's use to report the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. Well, first of all, relative humidity is, believe it or not, not the best variable that we use in science when it comes to expressing the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. I will have a separate video on relative humidity because people use it so often in everyday life. But I will demonstrate to you that it has the same problem, well, same class of problems as absolute humidity. And that means if the amount of water vapor in the air does not change, relative humidity can still change. And that's not good. We want quantity that will not change if the amount of water vapor does not change. That's first reason why I'm not introducing it in this video. Namely, it's very important, so I'll have it. It's very important for general public, so I'll have it in a separate video. But second reason I'm not introducing it in this video is relative humidity is defined in terms of something called saturation water vapor pressure. And as you can see, I still did not talk about saturation vapor pressure that is coming in next videos. And when we cover that, we can talk about relative humidity. Until those videos, goodbye.